Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this uh, session. It's a complicated session. I'll explain how we're going to be running it uh, in a minute. But let me welcome you first and uh, introduce myself. My name is Salim al Haq. I'm the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development at the Independent University of Bangladesh in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And this particular session, we're calling it Source to Sea. Uh, it's the South Asian regional uh, session for this resilience hub uh, that we have uh, all been participating in here for the last few days and hope to continue for the next few days as well. Um, let me explain what we've been doing in the South Asia region. We have been holding every day uh, virtual sessions with different organizations in South Asia hosting uh, a, a online, we're calling them satellite sessions, they're doing them online in South Asia. And then each of them is sending us a five minute video output here to Glasgow, and if you stand downstairs and watch the video screen, you'll see them uh, being presented uh, regularly, the different uh, sessions that are being held. Uh, so there's a, a virtual set of satellite uh, programs going on of people who couldn't come to Glasgow or didn't come to Glasgow, uh, but are still able to participate and send their messages here. So this is, a, 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 I, I think, a very novel and I hope a successful model for us to follow uh, so that not everybody has to fly to the COP to quote unquote participate in the COP. We are finding models of participation that don't require people flying across continents. Uh, but then at the same time, as you know, we are doing, and I'm, I must uh, acknowledge with gratitude, the Resilience Hub, uh, Race to Resilience Champions for organizing this very nice uh, venue. Well done, uh, David. and. Uh, also allowing us to have hybrid events. So we today are going to be doing a hybrid event from the South Asia region. And uh, I'll acknowledge the designer of this and, and the uh, manager of this is uh, uh, our good friend Simon Lucas, who is in Kathmandu uh, with the FCD office in Kathmandu. His, it was his brainchild. He got us all together and designed it. And uh, we are going to do it as a hybrid event with some of us here in Glasgow, in person speaking. Some people are in the green room right now. We'll invite them to come and uh, speak uh, um, at, at some point. Uh, they'll be on the screen live. And then in between, we have a series of videos that are coming from uh, different uh, organizations and, and people that we had uh, uh, engaged with and who will be um, we will be showing those. So, as I said, it's a bit of a complicated format. I haven't got everything, so I may get things mixed up. Uh, my, my assistant will correct me uh, if I do something uh, wrong and, and get my sequences wrong. Uh, but I will try and follow uh, my instructions as much as I can uh, for the next uh, hour or so that we are together. And so, let me start by uh, inviting our uh, three panelists who are here in person to maybe introduce themselves uh, as well. Uh, sorry? Uh, would you like to start? Yes, just introduce Hello. yourself. Thank you. I'm Daljeet. I'm from FCDO India. I'm the Climate and Environment Advisor. Thank you, Daljeet. Madan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salim. I'm Madan Pariyar, Senior Advisor of ID. I'm based in Nepal. Thank you. Uh, hello and good morning, everybody. Myself, Radha Wagli. I work for government of Nepal. Uh, I am currently working in the Ministry of Forest and Environment. Uh, I am leading the Climate Change Management Division, and I am the focal person for UN of Triple C as well. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, the way we have designed the series of interventions that we will have uh, over the next hour or so, we are going to start in the high mountains and then work our way down the mountains to the hills, to the plain lands, and then finally to the coast. In South Asia, as you know, uh, I come from Bangladesh, so I'm at the coast end of uh, this uh, spectrum. 
but then there are hills and then there are high mountains and our friends from Nepal represent the high mountains. So I'm going to now invite the first uh, uh, intervention or uh, that we will have is on ice stupas and it's going to be made by Sonam Wanchuk who is the founding director of the Students Educational and Cultural Movement of Ladakh, S-E-C-M-O-L, who will give a virtual presentation. Are we ready to do that? Good, thank you. Hi, yes, I am. Uh, thank you, Salim Mulak, and thank you, everyone. Hello, um, all at Glasgow and participating virtually. I'm Sonam Wangchuk uh, in the mountains of Ladakh. So I'll share about ice troopers, but um, I think images speak more than my words. So kindly let me share my screen. Uh, we'll, we'll share my screen from here onwards, if you can help me do that. Can you see my screen? Hello. I hope you are able to see my screen. Please let me know if you do. Hello, yes, we can. Yes. Okay. So I'll uh, go on. <clears throat> so this is where we are up in the or across the Himalayas on the Tibetan plateau as we enter that. Um, Ladakh is a little uh, different landscape from uh, most parts of the world. As you can see, it's almost like outer space, uh, 11,500 uh, feet into outer space very, very dry, uh, hardly any rain, 100 mm annual precipitation. But what makes it different and uh, makes it planet Earth is those little patches of greenery, which are thanks to our ancestors who mastered the art of using fossilized water since they had nothing, hardly anything from the skies, which is uh, glaciers. But unfortunately, today the glaciers are melting away fast and in springtime, when it is the sowing time, planting time, our farmers have a lot of problems, partly because it is still cold up in the glaciers when we need water down in the villages and partly because the glaciers are smaller and smaller. So uh, our ancestors over the years, despite all the uh, challenges of the mountains, um, learned to adapt to these challenges and have been known for creating uh, glaciers themselves, which are more like um, mythology than science. So in the recent past, some of us in Ladakh have been working on freezing the winter water because um, in this part, it can be so cold that as you can see, taps, freeze, and it's quite a circus to even run them. So we have to develop technologies ourselves as we stand as a climatic and technological minority. So inspired by our ancestors, some of us at our school, an alternative school for mountain uh, development, we started working on something called the ice stupas. The idea was to freeze the water in winter when it is unused and flows into the Indus and, you know, Arabian Sea because nobody is farming in winters. But in spring, May and June, there is a huge shortage. So we were looking at how to freeze it till June. Of course, people laughed because um, by March, all the ice is gone. But then we used some um, high school mathematics or geometry to be precise, whereby shapes like spheres, hemispheres and cones have low surface area for the given volume, which means that if we freeze them in these shapes, then the sun cannot melt it because uh, it's not enough surface area. And yet the farmers are interested in volume. So they get high volume thanks to the geometry. And we did several prototypes of them, um, hoping to extend it till May, but we were very lucky to uh, keep it till much later in the summer. I'll just share how it is done. It's very simple. We didn't have resources nor power or, you know, pumps, etc. And we didn't want to use them because people in the mountains may not have these resources. 
but the greatest resource we had was gravity as you can see here all the villages in the mountains have an upstream and a downstream and this stream you can see is just a trickle in uh, spring and winter but if we freeze this into ice cones giant ice cones then the water can be kept till late in spring this is the simple science you just put a pipe upstream and let it into the pipe primary school science says that water always maintains its level which means that the water at the outlet will want to go to the same level as inlet and if you bring it down to a dry patch of desert you can attach a fountain and the water will splash up in the air to go to the same level into the minus 20 air but and minus 20 air means the water that is liquid till then loses its heat mid air and starts freezing as it falls down and the shape it takes naturally is a cone and cone as i told you is the geometry that has low surface area and thanks to this it melts very late this was our pilot ice tupa um, and it surprised us by lasting till august uh, in a village and this is roughly uh, 60 feet tall and had contained 1 million liters of water which would be then used to water 5000 trees that the villagers planted as a proof of concept now to bring technology and tradition together we we named it after the stupas as you can see stupas are shrines or, or ancient monuments that people cherish as uh, spiritual monuments and even the prayer flags that monuments like stupas have we put on the eye stupas uh, mainly to position and brand it like something from traditions but also slightly to um, you know cause partial windbreak and partial sunshade in uh, springs but this had an immediate connect of the people with the new invention. We collaborated with everyone from spiritual leaders like His Holiness Chetang Rinpoche, who is a UN ambassador for mountain partnership to students to then use the water and promote the technique to green valleys in these mountains. So there are two techniques. One is to just build ice stupas in the stream, which by which it um, enhances the water. The other is that it can be channelized and collected in a tank, and then trees can be uh, watered from this. Like here, you can see 5,000 trees being plant watered. Now it has become a movement every winter many many villages the young people participate in ice stupa making competitions which gives them something interesting to do in the cold winters apart from providing water and it's spreading outside of Ladakh and India to Pakistan and to Bhutan and Switzerland uh, Czech Republic and uh, other countries also it's also becoming a source of income for young people some of whom have started ice cafes, ice climbing for winter tourism. I will stop here. Uh, this is uh, an ongoing story. Will uh, not take longer. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Sonam, for that excellent uh, uh, exhibition of uh, ingenuity. And they look beautiful as well. Uh, so let thank me you. now uh, move on to the next one. We will have time later on for people to make comments or questions. Uh, but let the next one is going to be on glacier lake outbursts, flood risk management. And it's going to be a virtual presentation by Arun B. Sreshta. Uh, in fact, a recorded presentation, uh, who's a senior climate specialist at EC Mode uh, in uh, Nepal. Can we run the video? Hello, everyone. Greetings from EC Mode in Kathmandu, Nepal. I'm extremely pleased to connect virtually with you all today for this important event. From AC Mode, uh, we are contributing to this session under the SPS2 Glasgow campaign to promote ambitious climate action for the Hindu Kush Himalaya. For this session, resilience from 
source to see. I'll be presenting on Glacier Lake outburst flood risk in the mountains of Hindu Kush Himalaya and the need to manage the risks to build climate resilience in the region. First, about the climate context. The Hindu Kush Himalaya is warming rapidly with warming rate of 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade, which is equal or slightly higher than the global average rate. The region is experiencing extreme and erratic precipitation patterns. Both warming and precipitation extremes are likely to increase in the future. So even the 1.5 degree world is projected to be too hot for Hindu Kush Himalaya, as this would mean a loss of one third of its glacier volume, while current emission scenario could lead to two thirds of glacier volume loss. Outside the polar region, the HPH has the highest snow and glacier concentration with uh, about 54,000 glaciers occupying about 60,000 kilometers area. And in the past three decades, the region has lost about a quarter of uh, the glacier area. And one of the major impacts of uh, shrinking glacier in, is the formation, growth and outburst of glacier lakes. This slide shows the spatial distribution of glacial lakes in Hindu Kush Himalaya and also by river basin. It is estimated that there are more than 25,000 glacial lakes at, occupying about 14,000 kilometers, kilometers square. Out of them, about 200 are considered as uh, potentially dangerous, which can burst out anytime. Here, I show just one example of a glacial lake outburst flood in Botekoshi River in Nepal, which happened in 2016. You can see how infrastructure can be at uh, risk of a uh, glacial lake outburst flood. And this glove actually originated in Tibet, China. So glove can also be have a transboundary impact. The risk is likely to increase in the future due to climate change and continued glacier melting and also due to socioeconomic changes. It is therefore highly important that loft risk is managed in a timely manner. In a broad sense, risk management includes two broad areas, risk assessment, which includes identification of potentially dangerous glacial lakes and downstream vulnerability assessment. And this would provide a list of priority lakes for intervention. The second broad area is to implement risk management measures for those priority lakes involving structural, non-structural, and nature-based solutions. But this requires significant investment, which is not in the capacity of many of the Indigo Himalayan countries. I have provided the cost of risk reduction in two lakes in Nepal, Chorolpa and Inja lakes. So the countries need additional investment for loss risk reduction. And it is high priority to establish a loss and damage finance facility with new and additional loss and damage finances. And I, I hope in this COP, um, there will be significant progress in loss and damage uh, related uh, issues. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arun, for that uh, excellent uh, uh, intervention on glacier lake outbursts, which is one of the hazards in the high Himalayas. We will now move from the high mountains to the mid-level mountains, the hills, and we have uh, a presentation on spring, sh spring shed management in the high uh, Hindu Kush by Sanjeev Buchar who is the Senior Water Management Specialist at ECMOD, which is a virtual presentation. Do we have that? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Salim Malak. I hope I'm audible. And uh, please, my request the organizers to upload my presentation, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of uh, today's event on resilient interventions with focus on scalable practical solutions. Uh, next, please. I'm also very happy to present our work on spring shed management, which we are 
taking forward with our partners. And Springshed Management is a nature-based solution for increasing water security and enhancing climate resilience in the Hindu Kushimala region. Next, please. Uh, springs, which actually emanate from naturally from the aquifers, they are the lifeline in the Hindu Kushimala region. Nearly 60 to 80 percent of the 240 million people living in this region, particularly in the hills and mountains, depend on springs for drinking, uh, sanitation, domestic, minor irrigation, and other water needs. And springs also contribute to the river's base flows, and therefore they are very important also for people living downstream who depend on spring-fed rivers. And they have immense cultural and ecological significance, in fact, many springs are considered sacred and also then protected from biotic interferences. Next, please. Uh, there is increasing evidence now that the springs across the Hindu Kushimala region are drying up. Now, according to India's Niti Aayog report, of the estimated 3 million springs in the Indian Himalaya region, about 60% have either dried or become seasonal. And a similar trend is being reported from Bhutan and Nepal too. Now, this is leading to a lot of water stress and in insecurity, both in the rural and the urban areas, and increasing workload and drudgery of women and girls who are traditionally responsible for fetching water for household needs. Now, some of the main causes, direct causes attributed to uh, drying up of springs are you know, erratic rainfall and slow, longer dry spells, land use land cover change, including forest degradation, infrastructure development, particularly roads, which cut across the aquifers, as well as natural hazards like landslides and earthquake. Next, please. Uh, but the good news is that the springs, drying springs can be revived. And based on the Himalayan stakeholder, uh, consultation we had in 2015, Isimod, along with its partner, uh, the Advanced Center for Water Resources Development and Management, Aquadam in India, we've developed a six-step protocol for reviving springs, which includes comprehensive mapping of springs and spring sheds, setting up data monitoring system, understanding gender, social, and governance systems of springs, Hydrogeological mapping, and this is a very important uh, step for identifying the recharge areas of springs, and then developing the spring shed management measures, which can be structural, like pits or shallow ponds, as well as vegetative and agronomic and management measures. And then whatever we're doing, we measure the impacts, not just from water discharge quality, but also from socio-economic aspects. Next, please. Uh, we are also implementing this protocol in several places, as well as many other organizations. Like in Dalak, Nepal, we've seen very good results of this six-step protocol implementation. We have, we have seen about 125,000 liters of additional spring discharge happening in lean season after the intervention, even though the rainfall during the intervention and after were less than the pre-intervention period. And there are many more examples and evidence like that. Next, please. <laughs> now, I think it's very important that spring shed management receives a lot of traction at policy and practice level and more support globally, nationally also. But the, because spring shed management integrates hydrogeological science along with socioeconomic and governance aspects, it's very important that we take a shift from the conventional watershed approach, which takes in more into account the surface water flows and a valley to ridge approach to a more spring shed valley to ridge to valley approach, which integrates both surface as well as groundwater. It's very important to enhance capacities at all levels for spring shed management, including for local communities, as well as decision makers and practitioners. And we need more collaborative actions for mainstreaming spring shed management 
in the policies and programs at national or subnational level as a major based solution for water security and climate resilience. Uh, thank, with that, I'd like to end. Thank you so much uh, for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev, for sharing that experience of uh, spring shed management. Very interesting indeed. Uh, now we will be coming to our live uh, speakers uh, for the next uh, a few interventions. The first one will be uh, Radha Wagle, who is the Joint Secretary and Chief Climate Change Management Division of the Ministry of Forest and Environment of Nepal. And she'll be talking about the NCCSP ILAPA implementation. So Radha, if you could just start by explaining what those acronyms mean. Acronym for NCCSP stands Nepal Climate Change Support Program, and the two stand for we, we already have for the first phase already completed, and this is now the up scaling of that previous NCCSP program. Uh, so I think I, I, I have my presentation. Someone could. Okay. Uh, this uh, this program actually led by the gov government and uh, supported by UK Aid. Financial assistance is through UK Aid, and Mott McDonald is uh, doing the technical assistant part. Next slide, please. Uh, I, I, I think all of us we know that Nepal is one of the most vulnerable country in the uh, uh, climate change due to. Uh, there's difficult terrain and diverse topography and the poverty, associated poverty and uh, other uh, various reasons. Uh, despite the low emission, we are, we are impacted by the global uh, emission and the climate change. And we have uh, different kind of vulnerability and then uh, m uh, we have total seven provinces. Out of seven provinces, some of the provinces, they are more vul vulnerable due to uh, different factors, including the climatic region and accessibility and uh, the other associated property and the, the pro project area is uh, actually in the Karnali prov province that is one of the most vulnerable province uh, in my country and there is high rate of poverty and the topography is very uh, rocked and the, the uh, road access is not, uh, not good um, and even there was no uh, road access before uh, two three years but now there is a road access but not everywhere and uh, there is vulnerability to climate related hazards such as flood, landslide, drought and uh, in recent days the uh, change in uh, snowfall pattern uh, and rainfall pattern that is uh, bringing so, so many other, other um, uh, climate induced difficulties for uh, the people who are living in the poverty. And, um, Actually, uh, the small scale and subsistence uh, lo local ma market economy is the basis for the rural people. And the engagement of women and marginalized people in decision making is very low. Uh, and um, they, they, uh, they have the time poverty as our first speaker so that the uh, w women and uh, girls, they are having more problem due to this water, re uh, water related um, scarcities. And uh, the NCCB SP2 uh, is implemented by the government. Actually, the local government is implementing those uh, uh, those program under the NCSCSP2 and uh, 23 uh, million pound uh, is uh, total uh, fund for that project and that is mobilized through our uh, central uh, government um, uh, uh, treasury system. The, that means they, they are the, they are, they own that budget and they, they make the plan utilizing that budget and they have full authority to implement uh, that budget and the TA support only uh, does the Mott Ma McDonald that is one of the company who is uh, assisting that project and the uh, main objective and aim of this project is to improve the resilience of climate vulnerable communities to uh, climate related shocks and future climate change. I think that is the one of the, our uh, uh, climate change policies major goal. Next slide please. And. Uh, can you enter one one more? Uh, there is a title. Uh, sorry, <laughs> maybe. Okay, go back. 
sorry and uh, th these are the uh, these are the strong point these are the approaches we are applying uh, for this project the first one is uh, climate change vulnerability and exposure index determines the fund allocation uh, during the planning phase we, we uh, in the uh, municipalities which is the most vulnerable and which is uh, which needs more more resources we categorize uh, the uh, uh, municipalities in different category and allocate the budget according to the vulnerability index and we have the seven step local level uh, planning process we follow that uh, planning process basically those se uh, seven step planning process is about building ownership uh, trying to find the local people's need and priorities and similarly the uh, uh, process of inclusion leaving no one behind is adopted by this seven step process and the third one is the priority for the project is uh, water management i think most of the uh, budget is allocated for water management and uh, also agriculture and forestry related uh, things and that is integrated to disaster risk management uh, and livelihood promotion and recent, uh, recently, after the COVID, uh, there is some su support for the COVID-related, uh, for example, hygiene, uh, nutritional security, and job creation. And similarly, uh, the, the ma major strength of that project is that is uh, led by community. There are several community uh, user groups, for example, community forest user groups, wa water user groups, agricultural user groups. They are lead leading uh, uh, small uh, projects under that scheme and we have multi-year periodic evidence based planning system we do the hazard mapping and we we take the demographic uh, demographic da data and we also collect the best practi practices and we uh, up scale that and out scale that practice practices and also it, it is based on uh, uh, focused on sustainability and that approach is scalable and replicable too and next slide please and th this is the uh, evidence-based planning system. We, we uh, uh, collect the data for rainfall and the hazard associated to it. And uh, we prepare some hazard mapping. And the, the map can be um, understood by every uh, section of the society. Even, uh, even the illiterate people, they can understand about the mapping, what is there, in which side there is, uh, is vulnerability for uh, flood, vulnerability for landslide. And they can use that map for their planning. Next slide, please. And here are some of the schemes which are, uh, have been completed and ongoing uh, at the moment. And uh, as I already mentioned, the water is the focused area. Uh, there are altogether uh, say 37 is schemes for drinking water. And uh, out of them, 30, 31 is already completed. And the uh, uh, rest of the, them are you know, ongoing. And similarly, in irrigation, there are 53. And altogether, we have on 194 schemes. And uh, most of them are completed. And some of them are still ongoing. Next slide, please. And and th these are uh, these are some of the photograph. I am I am com coming to the end. These are some of the intervention uh, which are shown in the photograph. The one is training, one is agriculture, and the other one is women participation. The women are uh, uh, are uniting and they, they are making their plan. And next slide, please. And this is the, the, the first one is before the intervention, and the second one is after the intervention. And now I, I'm at the end of my presentation. Can you go to, go to the first, the last slide? Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Radha, for that excellent presentation. You know, in the, in the climate change adaptation world, uh, Nepal is a world leader in terms of the local level adaptation that you have done, both at the planning level, at local community base, but also at the level of allocation of resources from the national budget and exchequer, two, two very good examples that we hope other countries will also learn from your example uh, going forward. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Let us now uh, hear from our next uh, panelist who is here with us, uh, Madan Pariyar, who is a senior advisor with the International Development Enterprises, IDE, in Nepal. And he's going to talk about climate smart agriculture. Madan, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salim, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to share with you all 
the ID's Nepal experiences on climate smart agriculture. I'll be basically reflecting on, uh, could, could you show you my, the, my presentation actually? Uh, I'll be basically reflecting on uh, the public-private partnership approach that was uh, of Anukulan Breast Project that facilitated uh, climate smart agriculture technologies and also mobilized last mile climate resilient agricultural ecosystems that worked closely with uh, uh, these uh, uh, climate vulnerable people working uh, and the local governments supporting investments for climate adaptations. Could you go to the next slide, please? ID helps, works to pro promote climate smart agriculture and it builds, uh, uh, you know, enhances the resilience of agriculture practices. It does this by understanding the, by understanding the needs and vulnerabilities of communities, designing climate smart products, strengthening value chains for, uh, uh, for these products adoption and also for you know uh, linking promoting financial services financial uh, uh, these climate information and safe, social safety net services please the next slide next slide please yeah the public private partnership approach which we also call as resilient market ecosystems has four major components the first one is developing and promoting uh, financial uh, products and services and partnering with financial, private financial institutions. Second one is uh, coordinating with local and national governments uh, to advocate for uh, climate, uh, these, uh, for smallholder farmers. And the third one is training farm business advisors. Uh, this is for um, helping them, you know, uh, serve with the private sector enterprises, uh, provide private sector extension services, and also deliver inputs, technologies, and uh, uh, financial products and other essential services. And the last one is uh, developing marketing plan planning committees, which are formed by uh, groups of uh, smallholder farmers uh, to coordinate a cropping calendar, disseminate uh, this uh, climate information or weather information and aggregate demand for inputs and also, you know, um, uh, manage these investments. Please, next slide, please. The accomplishment made by the project so far is by 120,000 households, they have increased their income by almost uh, about 230 pounds per year. Almost 500, more than 500 multiple used water systems have been developed, you know, serving 83,000 people. Uh, we have developed climate smart agriculture market systems engaging around 57 agriculture collection centers uh, and uh, around uh, 424 enterprises and some 180 last mile agents. And we have also facilitated around 41 local adaptation plans for action benefiting around 2 million people. Next slide, please. And I'm going to just um, Site here, like the example of uh, Kalsa, Kalsa Rawal. She is a smallholder farmer from a village called Sisnari in Surkhet district. Her husband migrated to India uh, for to seeking job, but she managed to earn additional income of around about 500 pounds per year through multiple use water systems and uh, using deep irrigation and integrated management technologies. Now with this, I stop my presentation, and, but I request you to uh, watch the video where Kalsa is speaking about herself, uh, her own experiences. Thank you very much. अब त्यही अलिअलि खाने दुई चार महिना त्यही खाने अनि किनेरै खान पर्ने अब इन्डियाबाट कमाएको पैसाले कति हुन्छ दुई तीनटा गाई थिए यो बाडी पुरै बाजै हुन्थ्यो त्यसपछि अब हामीलाई तरकारी लाउन पर्छ भन्ने अब पानी भइदिए अब त्यही साग पनि लगाएर खान्थे म माग्न जान्थिन मागेर खाए मैले सुतकेरी भएको 22 दिनको छोडेर हामी मेरो श्रीमान वहाँ इन्डिया जानु भो पछि तरकारी पनि नभएर Yesterday, boss said, "I'm not going to get my money back. I'm 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 going to get my money back.
कति दुख को कुरा थियो तरकारी अब मागे आप मिहनत नगर तो मागे कसले दी अब अल मेरे सर सीका मैं कति सिक मैं सुत्केरी भेस्त यहाँ तैसा हूँ चामल अलि भाग पैसा अब चामल कि अभी चामल कि फेरी तरकारी नो तरकारी को कस्तो दुख अब मैं पैसा भी नी अब ते भर काउली बंदा तो कहीं कि मैं अब सस्तों सस्तों साग और कि दाल सस्तों कि हम सर हमें पानी दिभ रजू सब पानी दिन सब कुछ सीख तरकारी ला सिक देखि मैं धेरे फायदा तरकारी बेचे पैसा चामल कि खाने गु आपने घर में तरकारी फला अभी भर धेरे राम सुंदर नेपाल संस्था ने हेरे देखि मेरे सर आएर मैं सीका देखि मैं कति सुख पाएं मेरे मनम अज पैला को रोई रोई बस तो अल मैं सुख मू म खुशी छु पैला को भाग धे खुशी छु अब अज भी बढ़ अज बढ़ Great, thank you very much, Madan, uh, for that presentation and for the video as well. So we are now uh, moving down from the uh, started off in the high mountains and the glaciers, and then the mountains, and now we are coming down towards the plains. And the first uh, uh, presentation on that will be by our uh, panelist here, Daljit Kaur, who is the Climate and Environment Advisor in the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Development Office (FCDO). in delhi and uh, she will uh, also have dilip singh who is the national project manager undp india and johnson topno who is the regional head of programs at fia foundation uh, also present so daljit over to you thank you professor hug good afternoon and namaste uh, everyone uh, i work with fcdo india which is partnering with government of india uh, in implementing a program called infrastructure for climate resilient growth icrg Uh, this program helps integrate climate risk management into india's largest social protection scheme called the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee scheme this is nregs uh, this uh, national guarantee scheme is uh, world's largest public work scheme and it actually reaches out to 70 million households across india uh, with the annual budget of around 10 billion us dollars Uh, what we are trying to do under the icrg is actually reach out to uh, 5 million people across seven countries uh, in india uh, and uh, with uh, with uh, our partnership with the government of india we are hoping that uh, the best practices from our program are uptaken by the government and this reaches out to 70 million households uh, we uh, have a short video that i would request karen to play Uh, the video basically presents two of the best practices on water uh, resource management uh, one is in orissa which is uh, the um, western state in uh, india and the other one is on flood management in bihar i would request uh, the video to be played thank you the latest ipcc report presents a rather grim picture of the climate crisis With about 60% of the Indian population dependent on agriculture, climate change will have a calamitous impact in a country where already the incidences and intensity of floods and droughts are increasing, pushing more and more people in the realm of poverty. In response to emerging challenges due to climate variables, the Infrastructure for Climate Resilient Growth or icrg a technical assistance program of the foreign commonwealth and development office government of uk is being delivered in partnership with the ministry of rural development government of india presently the program is being implemented by united nations development program in six indian states bihar odisha chatisgarh mp up and rajasthan and in jharkhand through PHIA network The program helps integrate climate risk information in the world's largest public works based social protection program the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme 
the dual focus of Mahatma Gandhi NREGA on wages and natural resources management infrastructure provides multiple benefits with respect to social protection and building resilience from climate change impact such as droughts and floods. Odisha has been a hot spot for climatic events like droughts and floods which have occurred in varying magnitude in different parts of the state, often leading to distress migration. One of ICRG's major focus areas, therefore, has been to address this climate impact. For now, they are implementing the program in five drought-prone districts of the state. Several initiatives have been deployed under the ICRG program to address the drought situation and improve the resilience of vulnerable rural population. Using GIS-based planning, the program is involving the community to create climate-resilient infrastructure like check dams, field bunds, gully plugging to harvest rainwater. They are engaging the migrant households productively in NREGA work, creating livelihood models through convergence with Odisha Livelihood Mission, Integrated Tribal Development Agency, among other things. By way of climate responsive planning and design, these interventions are making the barren land ready for cultivation and attracting investments from other government development programs. During 2021, Western Odisha experienced a drought-like situation due to deficit in seasonal rainfall, especially in the uplands. ICRG supported the vulnerable households by planning for future fit natural resource management works. It facilitated their access to a range of things including 200 days of work, seeds, fertilizers and other agricultural inputs. It set up community nurseries and additional income generation activities with self-help groups. Meanwhile, in Bihar, about 76% population in the northern part of the state lives in threat of recurring annual floods. The ICRG program in the state is being implemented across eight districts, some of which are highly flood-prone. Farmers in the rural areas are vulnerable to flooding because of water logging and sedimentation in their fields due to poor drainage and lack of proper infrastructure in the village. Traditionally, in many parts of the state, ahar pines have played an important role in drainage of excess rainwater and conservation of rainwater for irrigation post-monsoon. Pines are the drainage channels while ahars are small retention ponds for collecting excess water. ICRG worked closely with Mahatma Gandhi NREGA and Panchayati Raj institutions in the state to develop flood resilience through planning and implementation of works such as widening and deepening of pines and interconnecting this pine network. This was accompanied by rejuvenation of community pond or ahars with design recommendations such as strengthening of embankment through plantations, inlet-outlet system and staircase for protection of wall and easy mobility of women and disabled. Interconnection of the Ahar Pine Network, plantations on Ahar Bunds, among others, have proven effective to drain the flood water during monsoon and simultaneously conserve water for irrigation in the dry season post monsoon. When the Ahar was not a good thing, but the water was not a good thing, but the water was not a good thing. This is the way to get the these examples from ICRG intervention showcase the potential of mainstreaming climate resilience techniques in existing development programs and the role of resilient rural infrastructure that supports sustainable livelihood, thus building resilient communities. Is there another one or that was it? Okay.
Thank you very much, uh, Daljit, and, and uh, for your intervention and for the uh, videos that you showed us. Uh, we will now move on to the next uh, presentation, which is on urban flood management in Kolkata. And it's going to be made by Okju Jong, who is an urban climate resilience specialist at the Climate Change Resilience Trust Fund of the Asian Development Bank. And we also have Bonaparte Masan Kai, who is a GIS focal and administrator SPAD, Asian Development Bank. Do we have them virtually on? Uh, we are here. Good, yeah. very good. Please go ahead. We can yeah, hear you. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Hawk. And uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I am Okju Jong uh, from UCC RTF. Uh, with my colleague, Bon uh, Masangai, we will be presenting uh, digital solutions for urban flood, uh, urban flood management to Kolkata Fuse. Uh, may I request that the organizer share our uh, slide, please? Thank you so much. So uh, next slide, please. Yes. So uh, Kolkata is the capital city of West Bengal state, India, vulnerable to climate change. The climate risk is increasing through more frequent and intense rainfall events, cyclones. The city has also difficulties in expanding drainage capacity quickly because most areas are already densely uh, built up. The flood forecasting and early warning system that we present today uses a low cost and high density sensor network connected to a cloud, a cloud server and a satellite remote sensing based forecasting models. As you can see in the slide, uh, digital sensors have been installed in more than 250 critical locations of the city to collect real time flood and the environmental data on inundation, pump operations, canal status, and the air quality and the humidity. Um, the collected data are sent to a cloud server and then communicated publicly through KFLOOD website and the mobile app. Uh, as you can see in the slide, uh, the city sits in the flat terrain, and in case of a pluvial flood, four or two, six times per year, the lag time is often less than one hour. This fuse help the city government, the KMC, and the residents to react quickly and send warnings on a real-time basis. This is India's first city-level automated fuse in operation since 2018, supported by ADB and the UCC LTF. Now the government of the city KMC, ADB, and the UCC LTF are working together to sustain and scale up the system and for its better integration into city's decision-making uh, process. Uh, let me stop here and invite uh, my colleague Bon on the broader utilization of a smart and digital technologies for urban flood management. Thank you. Bon, over to you. And next slide, please. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Okju, and um, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good day, rather. So um, the Kolkata Fuse is an example of a digital solution for urban flood management where components like earth observation or remote sensing data, Internet of Things, climate modeling, and sensors are present. So in terms of um, earth observation, on your screen is a map of potentially flooded areas in Kolkata represented by blue polygons after the city were hit by the cyclone Amphan in May 2020. So using algorithms, um, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, Sentinel-1 satellite images from the European Space Agency were analyzed pre and post cyclone Amphan to have the estimated flooded areas within uh, Kolkata. So to visualize this uh, flood analysis, a tool like SPADE is needed. So uh, what exactly is SPADE? So next slide, please. All right, so SPADE or the Spatial Data Analysis uh, Explorer is a web-based GIS platform within ADB, which is on a centralized cloud-based uh, cloud server that contains uh, various geospatial data which can be utilized for uh, consultation, project preparation, production of maps, and analysis of climate change impacts. Currently, the platform is hosting data of more than 30 cities with global data sets like uh, flood maps, um, night lights, land cover, population density, forest loss, plastic pollution, and air quality maps. Through SPADE, decision makers can make 
informed and strategic decisions in terms of our project design and investments considering climate hazards and resilience across urban and rural sectors. So project officers and consultants can visualize how different factors can affect their projects using SPADE. The, the platform also promotes a systemic approach that is needed to integrate disaster risk and climate change resilience into conception, design, and construction of infrastructure projects. So currently, um, SPADE is providing technical assistance to project officers from different ADB uh, departments on climate projections, flood risk assessment, safeguards impact, remote monitoring, environment risk assessment, and spatial data repository. So in your screen is another example of uh, analysis on potentially flooded areas in Patukali, Bangladesh, uh, determined uh, using uh, algorithms. I, I would just like to highlight here that SPEED is doing all the analysis remotely, which is one of the strength of the platform given the COVID-19 pandemic we're in right now. So thank you everyone, back to you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we can go to our next uh, slide, and the final slide. So um, although it was, um, yes, very short, uh, I think, uh, yes, it is, is the last slide. So uh, it was very short, but hopefully this presentation uh, was useful. And uh, uh, for more details about the Kolkata Fuse and the UCC RTF and the ADB collaboration with KMC, please contact uh, uh, ADB project officers here indicated. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ogyu and Bon, for that excellent presentation. Uh, now we are moving, we've been in Nepal, we've been in India, and now we are going to move into Bangladesh. And the next presentation is on floating vegetables in floodplains, which is going to be given by Mr. Hasib Irfanullah, who is an independent consultant on environment, climate change, and research systems. And he's with us virtually. Hasib, are you with us? Yes, sir. Go yes. ahead. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, I'm Hasib. Uh, I'm based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. I will be talking about a technology which is a traditional one, floating agriculture system. As you can see from the photograph, you can create uh, those uh, floating rafts and can grow vegetables and seedlings uh, when the water uh, during the monsoon season. It's a traditional practice, but it has evolved over the last 100 years, and we can see six phases. I will be quickly going through them. The first is uh, definitely, as I say, that it's a traditional practice, but we don't know for sure that when it was first tried out by our Bangladeshi local people on the coastal area of Bangladesh. But uh, when the water hyacinth was introduced uh, more than 100 years back, uh, water hyacinth became the, uh, the base material to create the platform. That went on till 1960s, but then we started cultivating high yielding varieties of rice and the paddy straw wasn't suitable to create the base. That's why water hyacinth became the most prominent element. I'm calling it the second phase. Uh, and since 19, although it is located very, uh, very remotely uh, located, as you can see from the left hand side map, but since 1990s, it got the media attention and the third phase started during the same time when NGOs, development partners, they became interested in floating agriculture as a means of livelihood, nutrition, poverty alleviation, and as a part of community-based natural resource management. As you can understand, I haven't mentioned climate change yet because that came as a third, as of the fourth phase when CARE International NGO, they started apparently the first climate change adaptation project in Bangladesh back in 2004. And since then, there was no looking back. Uh, uh, floating agriculture became part of our national climate change strategy and action plan. Uh, and uh, later on, a few, day, few years later, the government of Bangladesh picked it up and started implementing quite a few large projects. I would like to mention two. One started in 2012 and another was the follow-up project. And currently, out of 64 districts of Bangladesh, 24 districts uh, have been having that kind of a scaling up of floating agriculture uh, as a means of climate change adaptation, as you can understand, being a flood vulnerable country, water logging will be, a, a, what, do you call, what do you call it, a long-term problem during the monsoon. And the sixth phase, the last phase, I would say I'm calling it sixth phase uh, because we have tried to introduce some innovation like aqua geoponics. We tried to integrate not only floating vegetables, but also fish and poultry. 
and that that actually shows that uh, how how things are being uh, uh, innovated, uh, improvised, and during that same time, we saw that the global recognition IPCC fifth assessment report, report recognized floating agriculture. FAO recognized floating agriculture, declaring it globally important agriculture data system. Uh, and uh, uh, not only water hyacinth, but art artificial frames have been used to uh, as a part of the innovation. Uh, as you can see, uh, if we look into the two maps, you can see how it scaled up through uh, partnership between not only the com local communities, but also NGOs, development partner, and the government. But what lies ahead, the next phase, uh, how, how it would look like since we are talking about climate uh, vulnerability, which will be enhancing over the years. I hope that how this small story, this short story of floating agriculture from Bangladesh shows that sometimes solutions are within ourselves. We need to look into it. We need to reinvent it and bring everybody together. Thank you very much uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my uh, story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asib, for that uh, excellent uh, story of the floating uh, gardens in Bangladesh, floating agriculture. Uh, we are coming towards the end of our time allocation. Uh, we have a couple of more presentations. Uh, the next one is on loss and damage responses to Cyclone Amphan in Bangladesh, and it's going to be uh, virtually presented by Ishtiaq Ahmed, who is a program coordinator at my center, ICAD, and Rafiqul Islam Montu, who is a free freelance journalist. So over to you, Ishtiaq. Thank you, Dr. Haq. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, Ishtiaq Ahmed, uh, working as a senior program coordinator at the International Center for Climate and Development. I've been given 30 seconds to briefly introduce the video. So I'll be very brief. Uh, so we all may recall the cyclone in May 2020, which hit uh, the West Bengal and the coastal line of Bangladesh, left a destruction trail in those areas. Even though we have been very successful in saving lives, when we visited those areas a year later, we have seen people still living on the banks. They haven't been able to go back to their houses. And that uh, made us question how we are addressing the loss and damages that are happening because of these uh, destructive uh, cyclones. It's also evident that uh, the cyclone Amphan, when it was at the bell, it, it was in the uh, ocean, it became a super cyclone because the ocean temperature, surface temperature was two degrees higher than usual. So uh, without further ado, I would like to share the video. I would like to uh, request the organizer to play the video and please enjoy the video. Cyclone Amphan, which swept across the coastal regions of West Bengal and Bangladesh in May 2020, had left a trail of destruction along the coastal line of Bengal. It became a super cyclone while it was in the Bay of Bengal, where the sea surface temperature was 2 degrees above normal, which made it turn into a super cyclone. In the past decades, such super cyclones used to kill tens and thousands of people in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. However, since then we have put in place one of the best cyclone warning and evacuation systems in the world. As a result, during Amphan, nearly 3 million people had received the warning and relocated to shelters successfully amid the COVID-19 pandemic. Volunteers allowed for social distancing by preparing extra shelters. The number of deaths were only a few dozen and mostly fishermen who could not get to the land in time. This was a major success in reducing the loss of lives. However, a year after Amphan, we visited the area and found thousands of people who were still unable to return to their homes, which had been destroyed by the storm. Some are still living in cyclone shelters, some in school buildings, and some near road embankments. For others not lucky enough, the boats have become their last refuge. Their agricultural land had become infertile by saline deposits and river water fishes destroyed as seawater breached the mud embankments and made its way into the mainland. The area is still recovering from the impacts of Cyclone Isla 11 years ago. 
Cyclonum fun was worse. The repeated damage had driven many thousands away. Families have been forced to migrate to the slums of Khulna and Dhaka. So, although effective disaster planning and preparedness by Bangladesh have been successful in saving lives, it still cannot prevent the loss of livelihood of the people whose lives were saved. With rising seas and frequent storm surges swallowing up land and destroying livelihood options, families along the coastal line of Bangladesh are fighting to survive. This is a stark example of loss and damage from human-induced climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ishtiak and Rafikul. These photo pictures were by um, Rafikul Islam Muntu, who is a photographer uh, who specializes in coastal photography. Uh, now we have our last formal uh, presentation, which is on rainwater harvesting in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. It's from Mohammed Mahmoudul Hassan, who is the coordinator of the climate change program at the Christian Commission for Development in Bangladesh, CCDB, and who's joining us virtually. Do you uh, hear me? Yes, uh, go ahead. We can hear you. OK, great. Uh, good evening from Bangladesh. Uh, welcome to our presentations. Would you share my presentation, please? Okay, so uh, well, when we are talking about here in uh, Glasgow and this residence hub, uh, many women living in coastal area already spent today a couple of hours for collecting the drinking water from different sources that actually we'll be talking today. Next slide, please. CCDB uh, it started its journey in 1973, and same way, uh, the climate change program of CCDV, they are working one of the most victim of to the climate change, the coastal districts, Shatkura, Bagarhat, and Borguna, where the cyclone Cedar in 2007 and cyclone Ida in 2009 hit those areas and devastating massacres was happened there. So we are working there for last 10 years, especially for the poverty direction, climate change, and as well as livelihood protections. Next slide, please. And this is a very common scenario and how we are using the uh, rain water exactly. The problem is that salinity intuitions in water sources, two purposes, one is drinking and one is irrigation. After any devastating cyclone, what happened? People do not get uh, very good water. Uh, the field has been damaged, saline uh, you can find even on the croplands there. Water is here, but not for the drinking. We are getting very good water from the Himalayas that we are listening today, but the Bay of Bengal that is protecting to get this water, saline water is interesting in that all the locality. Next slide, please. So what we are providing at the local level for the domestic household, we are providing a reservoir around 1,500 liter water can be stored there. They can use from the dry season from November to March. Just think about that, a five person living in a house, taking water 10 liter in a month, 300 liter, that can go for around four to five months. But what will do if there is a no enough water or the some people who are not uh, going for effort, this type of domestic reserve, they can go for a large scale, the community based water reservoir. You can see to your next, the right slide, the next one, the right one slide, there this reservoir around 20,000 liter water is stored there and community people can drink this water from here when their own household reserve is empty. So that is a very good example from these villagers that is happening in the Shatkura as well as Borguna. Next slide, please. Scarcity of the water for the irrigation is a very common there. So we, what we have done, we are going for the digging the ponds and canals and storing the surface water, especially for the rainwater during this monsoon that is collected to this um, pond as well as the some canals. But interestingly, we are using solar pump to get the water from a far away. Around 95 acres land are getting irrigation from this rainwater. You can see the right side, the pictures, 
Uh, apart from this uh, rainwater harvesting, you can see the vertical homestead gardening, something like that here. You can see it's an adaptation, very good adaptation, uh, working in the tidal area of the coastal belts there. So people can use this rainwater for the irrigation in their homestead, as well as the deep irrigation where the scarcity of water is a very common. Next slide. How people can operate this one? CCDB has developed Community Climate Resilience Center, that is a CBO, as well as in each of the interventions, there are water management committee, both of them working together for a better water governance there. So the ultimate goal is to provide climate adaptive solutions in the community. Thank you very much. Next slide. That concludes our formal presentation and unfortunately also our time allocation. So rather than have the panel discussion, I'm just going to invite uh, Mr. Pema Gamcho, who's here with us, to say a few words, if you would mind just giving him the microphone. And can I also ask if Mr. Uh, Rajeshwari is in the audience? We don't have Mr. Rajeshwari. Okay, please. Uh, 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 Pema, please, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Salim. Very interesting set of presentations. We have seen how water flows down from the source to the sink. The common thread of today's uh, presentation is water. Water in terms of uh, space, water in terms of time. Water is available, but in the wrong place. Water is available in the wrong time, not at the right time. So I think all these interventions that we have heard today are geared towards addressing water. Adaptation, I feel, is all about water, whereas mitigation is much more to do with energy. So I think today's threat is clearly seen from all the presentations, from the panelists here to the ones we heard virtually, is all about water. So I think if we want to address climate change, the important thing to remember, the key issue we need to address is water. So with this, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pemala. And, and if we Um, before we conclude, and I let you go, uh, we do have a video from Anne-Marie Trevelyan, who is the uh, uh, climate champion of COP26 on uh, adaptation and resilience. And, and since you didn't get to ask questions here in the panel, please get hold of the panelists uh, and get hold of them later on and ask your questions to them if you have any. Please, uh, the video. Climate resilience colleagues, thank you for the invitation to speak to you all as the COP26 International Champion on Adaptation and Resilience. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person, but I wanted to record this message to stress the importance of helping people deal with the impacts of climate change in the most vulnerable parts of the world. I'm talking about the over half a billion people who live in countries like Nepal and Bangladesh, as well as those living across northern India. Now more than ever, we need to support the race to resilience to help those people on the front line of the climate crisis. The World Bank estimates that climate change risks pushing over 40 million people back into poverty in South Asia without our help. So that's why I'm glad to see that this event is focused on practical solutions to build resilience, working with nature and local communities. This event reminds us how different the impacts of climate change can be for people. In the mountains, we know that rising temperatures are melting glaciers and causing glacial floods while changing seasonal rainfall patterns, which disrupts agriculture and tourism. In the hills, landslides, invasive species and dwindling water resources are taking their toll on rural communities. In the plains, floods, heat waves and droughts are affecting both agriculture and those working and living in increasingly unlivable cities. And in the coastal areas, rising sea levels and increasingly severe and frequent storms are threatening to wipe out both agriculture and coastal cities that are the engines of the economy in India and Bangladesh. So while we need to focus efforts on reducing emissions to limit temperature rises, we cannot ignore the need for urgent action to build resilience now to save not just this generation of people living in the region, but also the next. That's why I am impressed that today's event is dedicated to finding solutions to those challenges. 
We know there is no one-size-fits-all answer, so the best way forward lies in practical measures developed and delivered locally. We have seen excellent signs of what is possible with ice stupas, spring management, urban disaster management, flood prevention and local adaptation plans. It's a really impressive range of programmes delivered by an amazing group of individuals. So I want to thank you all. I am proud to say that the UK has been supporting many of these initiatives from glacial lake management in the Himalayas to climate smart agriculture in Nepal. We have been working with the Indian government to make the world's largest social security programme climate resilience and improving the flood preparedness of Kolkata and Delta areas. Ultimately, all the solutions I'm talking about can only help deliver the race to resilience for all if they go global. That's not just what the UK wants to see as holder of the COP presidency, but also what the world needs to see. That's why the UK is continuing to meet its fair share of climate finance, and we have committed £11.6 billion of international climate finance to support climate vulnerable countries over the next five years. We will continue to push others to meet their commitments and ensure that initiatives like these can have the maximum life-saving and resilience-building impacts for the millions at risk in South Asia. By running the Race to Resilience together, we can all ensure that no one comes last. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, for those uh, uh, remarks. And with that, I conclude this session. Thank you all for being here with us. And as I said, if you have any questions, get hold of the panelists as they come out uh, downstairs. Thank you very much. And over to you, Karen.